So I was uh, coming back from Seoul. So I went to Seoul, South Korea for two days. And so you might not want to get too close to me. I think I'm okay with the COV 2019 virus or whatever. But I was delayed in uh, Tokyo for uh, a couple of days. But the one thing I uh, enjoyed on this little trip was that uh, as we warm up to this, as you fly westwards uh, from uh, North America to Asia in the wintertime and the summertime as well, the sun basically follows you. So you end up in the sun all the way. And um, one of the places we flew over was actually the place where I had my very first job. So I know you don't believe that I'm a little bit older than you now, uh, but when I was your age, essentially your age, 22 as I recall, my first job uh, when I arrived in uh, Calgary, I was sent straight away north that day, start work on a Monday, um, leave town on Monday after buying some warm weather gear, thermal underwear, etc. And on a flight to Edmonton, and then at four o'clock in the morning on the Tuesday, a flight from Edmonton through Yellow, uh, actually, no, it's actually Yellowknife, flight from Yellowknife to Norman Wells, so on the top left there. And so that was my very first uh, job. So my first job was standing on, actually not so different, uh, it would have been, actually, it's almost exactly 40 years ago. <laughs> so you can do the math and work that one out. And uh, the job was, this is uh, Norman Wells Northwest Territories. And it's an interesting place because it's uh, the Mackenzie River, which flows north into the uh, Arctic Ocean, Beaufort Sea actually. A uh, big, big honking river, kilometers wide. You can't get a scale for that, but you see an island with a kilometer wide river. And the job was to do site investigation for these little islands here, which you perhaps can't see very well, but they're artificial islands. And so this is in the day before directional drilling for Marcellus, etc., was done. That you know, you go down three kilometers and you kick off horizontally. So this is a um, uh, an anticline, which was a um, uh, petroleum reservoir uh, and it was shallow probably a few hundred feet deep and instead of directly drilling from the the bank to get into it they uh, drilled vertically but from inside uh, in the river very fast flowing relatively shallow river but fast flowing river so these six or I think it was eight artificial islands are drill pads which are wells which are there all the time so I thought that was kind of cool and so we'll talk about that when we talk about um, site investigation, but I think when you use Canvas, the little cameo that is for Environmental Systems 408 is actually me standing on river ice 40 years ago, I guess, uh, in front of a, a small drill rig. Uh, so anyway, so it's a nostalgia trip for me. It's kind of uh, interesting to, to fly over such places. Anyway, all right, so my apologies uh, for not being with you. Um, last week. I'm sure you're very hurt by that. Oh yeah, this is where it is in, uh, if you zoom out. So just to get a perspective, it's about, it's almost on the Arctic Circle, just about, just below, just below it I believe. And so actually it used to be this uh, oil reservoir used to be a um, petroleum reservoir in the Second World War with what's the, called the Canal Road which goes over westwards with the idea to be able to supply oil if uh, the Japanese invaded the Aleutian Islands, which they did on one island, but it didn't come to anything more than that. So anyway, so a little history trip for that, okay? So maybe we should get to talk about um, uh, contaminant hydrology. So that's, wh that's where we are today. So uh, to put things in perspective, what we'll do with today um, is that so far we've talked a lot, and actually you'll see, so those of you who've been in 303 will have seen this already and you could imagine this turned on its side and being a dean apple percolating through the the subsurface to get somewhere you can see some kind of round shapes there which are grains spherical shapes uh, projected as round shapes which are grains and the pores in between them in which two fluids are, or blobs of fluids are flowing and so what we'll do today is we'll make the next step to be able to understand exactly 
how fluids move in the subsurface. So we've said something so far about kind of their equilibrium states, and maybe we'll recap that first. Uh, but the next step after that is to be able to say something about how they, they move in the, in the subsurface. So that's our, our goal for today. Um, and so the big picture is, if I can find where we are, I guess this is where we are. Yes. All right, so, so maybe, uh, so what we'll do today is we'll talk about Darcy's Law, and which you'll have seen already in 452 if you've taken it. And more specifically for when we have multiple, multiple fluids, we'll talk about what we'll refer to as, as multiphase flow. But maybe just to, to recap, uh, we might just skip back to see where we've been over the last few sessions. And I'll use this just to be able to, to kind of gather our thoughts. And those thoughts are that we have tried to say something about what the, the equilibrium situation looks like for fluids as they percolate in the subsurface. And we can use interfacial tension, the concept of interfacial tension, to say something about that. And uh, we've used uh, Capri models. Which I'm going to make this smaller, thinner. And so those models have been things that looked, for instance, a little bit like um, individual capillary tubes uh, pushed into fluids. And we talked about, for instance, height rises in these, which are called HC. I think we looked at individual plates also in fluids to be able to say something about the, the height rise again in these, again defined just as a uh, a, a capri height which is something like um, for the uh, circular tubes it's something like four times interfacial tension divided by um, the diameter and the unit weight of the fluid and for this, where it's some aperture, it's something like two times the interfacial tension divided by the aperture, and again, the interfacial tension. So this is the aperture that we're dealing with here. And we can convert those uh, merely by multiplying both sides by uh, unit weight. to get Capri pressures, which are things would give us something like an expression like this. Proportion, so the pressure that you have to apply to push something in is proportional to the interfacial tension and inversely proportional to the diameter. And I guess for this it's the same, but the characteristic dimension, whoops, here is the aperture. And so that's fine. So that says something about what happens within a single Capri tube. But that's not so useful for us, because if we want to be able to say something about what this is, we know this is kind of a single capillary tube which we have going here, because we've got this penetration along this sinuous pathway. But what we're probably a bit more interested in is being able to take something that looks like uh, a representative volume that includes both the red stuff and the water together and say what happens when you have a whole bunch of these little features which are all statistically different um, uh, diameters. And to do that we talked about Capri pressure versus saturation curves. And these look something like out. I know I'm right on the cusp here, but just so it follows directly, I guess I can't use it. And we have a Capri pressure here, which we can also define as the difference between the non-wetting fluid pressure minus the wetting fluid pressure. And it scales with the kind of curvature of this uh, meniscus. <coughs> 
Um, and we can also write it as what we return as the J function, which is just a non-dimensional function, which is the capillary pressure divided by the interfacial tension and multiplied by the ratio of permeability to porosity. Two things we haven't really defined yet. And these curves, if I can draw them, uh, are a function of saturation of water between 100, 0 and 100 percent. And they look something like this. And this is your current assignment, is I think to plot one of these things. And they, if we do these things in terms of this expression here, then this bubbling pressure, which we've called PC0, I'm guessing, in the stuff that you looked at, bubbling pressure, is the pressure you have to apply to be able to force a fluid into the biggest capillary you have. So it's equivalent to this. This is kind of an entry pressure here, this height rise. And if we only had um, a medium that had all the same capillary diameters in it, then this curve, instead of looking like the red curve here, it would look like this. It would basically do this, right? All of a sudden, as you increase the pressure above this initiation pressure, it would flood the biggest capillary. All the capillaries would be the same size, so it, it would fill the whole system. And so, in other words, it would make this thing all, all green. It would completely um, fill it. But that's not the case, because we have kind of a a range of very big capillaries and a range of smaller ones. And so as you increase the pressure slowly to push it in, it starts invading progressively smaller and smaller capillaries. And that's why we get that behavior. And so that's important in being able to understand exactly what this saturation might look like and the difference between the saturation that we might expect to have here, right? which if this was, if the, uh, so this would be something that would exist, I suppose, like here, right? Not very much water, but lots of the non-wetting fluid, as opposed to this one. So this is A. And I suppose this one would be uh, B, which would be much more water and much less napple. Can't see the B press so well on the background. And so that's kind of what um, we, we were interested in doing um, in being able to define these. So that's the, the first item. The second item is that we uh, can understand that when we look at these uh, kind of pervasive penetrative systems of denapples going down through the water table, we can understand that they're, why they're so penetrative. And we can understand that because we looked at kind of the idea of the fact that you could have, um, let's use a different color, you could have a section in the ground oh, that looked like one fluid overlying another. And the analysis we did, we said, what it's like the analysis of a um, salad dressing, oil, uh, oil over vinegar. And so the vinegar sits on the bottom uh, because it's mainly water, and the oil sits on the top. Can you turn that upside down so the more dense fluid is on the top? Well, you can in theory, but if you develop a little cusp on the bottom here, the problem is that this cusp grows and grows and grows and becomes this little bead that keeps on going down. And so just based on the statics of the system, we could evaluate the fact that um, this tongue should keep on going down through here, and it will only stop when it hits a capillary barrier where the pores are so small that it can't get into it anymore. Remember in this diagram here, these are big marbles above here and smaller marbles below. So it's kind of a capillary barrier. And so this capillary barrier is what stops it and cups it and stops it from going any further. But, and this only relies on our real understanding of, of this capillary behavior. But this distribution of saturations as a function of capillary pressures, we did use to be able to explain exactly 
how we could figure out as we go down in depth within this section, we could actually figure out exactly what the, the average saturations should look like. And we can do that by taking this figure here and just by turning it upside down. And so there's a, a figure that we used a fair bit. Hopefully we used it in the video that you had last time. And maybe it's the closing one, maybe not. Maybe I should have found it before. This is the idea. This, this one here. It's an incredibly Im important figure. And you notice that this curve here is really this capillary pressure versus saturation curve, which we've just drawn. It doesn't have the second um, leg on it, which would be something that would come down like this, depending on which direction you're going. But it's basically the same thing. And what this allows us to say is something like what the distribution of saturations uh, in this particular case of water and air in the Vedos zone are, which we're perhaps not so interested in. Uh, or by turning it upside down, we can use it to look at what the pressure distribution would be in this denser than water non-aqueous phase liquid, the Dean apple, relative to the distribution in the water which is less dense and therefore the pressure builds up less quickly. The difference between these two pressures is the capillary pressure. Actually this up here, it's exactly what it is. And so if we can get the magnitude of this capillary pressure at any depth, we can always scale this figure to be able to define capillary pressure, which increases from zero at some location to a bigger number. And as this capillary pressure progressively increases, it means that uh, as we go deeper within the section, then this amount here would be the saturation of the non-wetting fluid, the denapple in, in our case. And this would be the remaining saturation of the wetting fluid, typically water. And so we can get some quantitative val evaluation of how far this thing might have gone and also say something about the distribution of saturations, which we, which we might be interested in knowing if we want to be able to, to, to remediate it somehow. So that's, I guess, where we've gone. What we haven't said is anything about the rates at which that can occur. We've assumed it can happen. It's an equilibrium process. These represent the equilibrium behavior once it's reached a steady state and is not moving anymore. And we've said nothing about how it gets there or how it will move after the fact. It's pretty clear that once it gets there, well, actually it's not necessarily that clear, but I'll make the statement that once it does get there, capillary forces are so incredibly strong that typically it doesn't move very readily. The only way you can get it out is not by trying to suck it out, because you'll be fighting against it, but you can dissolve it. So that's the first thing that we need to know. Uh, but if you can change the system somehow, heating it up, using surfactants to be able to reduce surface tension, for instance, then you could imagine that you might be able to remove it. And in that mode, and for other reasons, we'd like to know something about the rates at which this um, process might occur. And that's our, the next question that I thought we'd address today. And so that's kind of where we're, we're going today. And so the question is how we want to, to do this. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to think I'm going to do it by my own writing today, just for change in pace. But we'll first of all talk about um, the kinds of behaviors that we're interested in. Ah, actually, let's go back to this. This is a perfect example. And so this is actually a very interesting, it's a comp interesting company. It's called Ingray. It's now been bought out by Halliburton. One of my colleagues, Avrami Grader, who used to work here, went there to be their chief scientific officer, I think. He was into CT scanning and pore scale uh, measurements in uh, in a CT scanner to be able to do these kinds of things. And so Ingrain's business model is quite interesting. They take drill chips that come out from a drill rig, size of your, your pinky nail maybe. Uh, they CT scan them to get the porosity. And then they run really complicated uh, numerical models to be able to do this kind of thing. And from this, measure the virtual fluid in on one face and the virtual fluid out on the other face to give a a flow rate, and they define the permeabilities and saturation characteristics, PC 
versus saturation curves that we've just defined by taking just the geometry and knowing the fluids that will be in there. And so that's one way that we could look at this. And so that's clearly an important way of being able to characterize this behavior because this says something about the rates at which these fluids will migrate in a porous medium. We're not so interested in looking at it at a pore scale, but we'd like to have some, for this block, an average flow rate that comes out of this piece of rock, given that we put an upstream pressure and a downstream pressure on it, which is uh, indicative, if you like, of the permeability, which we can then use in continuum models to do modeling of, of these systems as we might want to do it. So that's kind of the, the place that we want to, to, to be going with this. And so the first step in that, actually I'll go back and, and do that. Uh, actually, I didn't need to, uh, to do that. And as I say, I'm going to do this from my own first principles. So the first thing that we maybe have to look at is defining exactly what we mean by uh, Darcy's Law. You've seen it elsewhere. I guess it's just telling me that I have a new thing that's saved. So uh, maybe this. Named for Henri Darcy, who was looking at the fountains in the town of Dijon in France and came up with the fact that flow rate was proportional to the, the head that's uh, applied on it. And the idea is pretty straightforward. The easiest way to think of it is maybe to take a, a tube that has a um, a pressure applied between upstream and downstream. We can define that pressure in terms of a, a head or length. You know, it's just the height that fluid rises in the upstream reservoir um, to get some kind of um, flow rate out, either as a velocity or a volumetric flow rate, which is equal to a velocity times an area, where this is the area of that downstream portion. And you've certainly seen the relationship before. And that is that volumetric flow rate, uh, let's actually look, the velocity is equal to hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the change in head gradient with a length. And since the volumetric flow rate is equal to the Darcy velocity, not the advective velocity, but the Darcy velocity multiplied by the total cross-sectional area, then this is just by multiplying the above relationship and changing the length for maybe an x. That's just the differential equation that defines the behavior. Usually there's a, a negative sign which is applied to it, and that's because flow occurs in the opposite direction to the gradient. And so you could think of this, if you like, as being this pipe which is put in this direction. If this is head and this is the gradient of head, then clearly by extension this is dh dx. This gradient is positive, but as you can imagine, the flow that comes out of this is in the negative x direction. So that's all that means. It doesn't mean so much when you're talking about a flow rate because that's an aggregate uh, behavior. And so that's fine. That might have been the way that you've dealt with uh, Darcy's law before. So the other way is you can also define this in terms of pressures. And pressures is much more convenient for us because heads is ambiguous because you have to define a head through a unit weight to define a pressure. And we know that in systems we might have more than one fluid, and so which unit weight do we end up using? And so the corollary of that diagram that we just drew for looking at pressures is if I draw the same kind of diagram here, but relative to some datum. And this is a uh, height, Z2. And let's say that 
coming out of here is some um, elevation of um, uh, a reservoir. So this is a height which is unit weight of fluid or pressure divided by unit weight, which is a length, right, by definition. Upstream, there's a different elevation, which is Z1. And again, up, whoops. And then this reservoir height on the upstream side is this pressure one over unit weight. Gamma, this is my bad gamma, I guess. And we're interested in what comes out of here in terms of either um, a volumetric flow rate or a Darcy velocity. Uh, we know we have a cross-sectional area. And we can do exactly the same as we did before. And that is that the volumetric flow rate is equal to the Darcy velocity times an area. Actually, let's work in terms of velocities. And so what we could do, I guess I should do this, is that if we, that's my bracket, this term here is equal to the sum of the two um, head, head terms. One is a elevation head, one is a pressure head, Bernoulli, and one would be a velocity head, which we is typically so small we don't care about, then we throw it away. And so if we uh, write this out, then this is equal to a rate of change of head, which is the same as, if we write it out in longhand, a rate of change of these two components, which will be these. So I'll write them the other way around, pressure divided by unit weight plus elevation. Could be upstream or downstream. And if I write it out in longhand, it's change in pressure with location plus change in vertical direction with horizontal component. I guess there's this term in here. And there should be a bracket. This is a P, by the way. It doesn't really look like it. And so the reason for doing that is that you realize that we have two terms. The one term that I didn't, I guess I should describe a kind of coordinate system. So this, let me put this as the x direction. And the vertical direction is our z, positive upwards. And so if you look at this, then you could imagine, I suppose, having flow in these two different directions. One is in the horizontal direction. And if you look at the velocity in the horizontal direction, it's going to be equal to, I missed out the minus, but I should put it in, I suppose, hydraulic conductivity times the change in pressure with direction plus uh, unit weight plus the change in vertical direction relative to x. And the point of doing that is that the x direction and the z direction are orthogonal to each other. So by definition, this term drops out and is 0. And so really, the velocity is equal to the hydraulic conductivity times the pressure gradient. If we look at flow conversely in the vertical direction, and then I suppose uh, we would write out the flow in the z direction is equal to, again, hydraulic conductivity, uh, brackets the change in pressure, I suppose, with z, 1 over unit weight, plus the change in pressure, no, no, sorry, the change in elevation, z, with z. Right? 
So all that's changed in this is that these terms, which we have here, have been swapped out for the x's. And so by definition, this term here, since the flow direction now is kind of in the same direction as this, this is equal to 1. And so this is, this is the correct form of the expression. Sometimes you'll tend to use it like this, but you have to be careful because uh, you need to account for what I always refer to as the swimming pool effect. And that is that if you think about a swimming pool, um, where you have the change in water pressure occurring as a function of depth, so this is pressure versus, this is minus z, right, going downwards. This is positive z up here. So by definition, you know that from fluid statics, the change in pressure with elevation is equal to minus unit weight of the fluid. So by definition, I bet you never thought you'd ever be using this again, but of course you are. This is equal to dp dz. And so by definition, if you think about this, um, this is equal to 1, and this is equal to the unit weight of water. So this is what you experience in a, um, a swimming pool with, with water. So this says that as you go down within a swimming pool, the pressure is increasing. And so if you use that to calculate what the velocity was in the system, if you imagine this as being a porous medium, it would tell you that because the pressure is increasing, that it would be actually flowing upwards. But it's not flowing upwards at all because it's exactly resisted by its, by its weight, pushing it down. And so you can use this in a swimming pool, but you can also use this in a porous medium. And so if you, for instance, went into a porous medium and you measured the pressure distribution as being along this line, there would be no flow because this is exactly what's going on. This component here directly counteracts the magnitude of the pressure gradient, uh, which is a negative pressure gradient in this case, right? Because this is positive z. And so this quadrant is negative. So they, they cancel out and there's no velocity. If the pressure gradient looked like this, then it means that at depth you have a larger pressure than you would do otherwise. It means that indeed you'd have a flow in the z direction positive upwards. And if conversely the pressure gradient as you went down looked like this, then that would signify that you have a flow velocity in the down direction. So that's important to understand. So, so we're going to make this switch from using heads in Darcy's law to making pressures because it's more convenient when we talk about multiple fluids. And so this is the first step in that. But I also notice that you can always, absolutely always use this. And so you'll do an assignment where you look at flow in a vertical section and you can still always use this expression here. You can always use head, which includes both the effects of elevation and pressure together. But if you use pressure, you have to be wary of the fact that you take care of this extra, take account of this extra term. Okay? So that may be a, a little confusing, but this is the correct form of the relationship that we should use. The other thing that we might also do is that uh, if we want to use pressure, it's convenient for us to use um, permeability. And you've already partly used this, but we could write this equation for Darcy's law as um, hydraulic conductivity times the change in head gradient. Um, we can also write this as hydraulic conductivity times uh, the change in pressure gradient. Which you'll notice is exactly what we have up here. 
which we can define as hydraulic conductivity over rho g. And we can also write it as permeability over viscosity times dpdx. So, so k equals hydraulic conductivity, which is in units of meters a second of velocity. Permeability is uh, lowercase k. which is in strange units of meters squared, length squared. And actually, the length, the characteristic dimension, you can think of as a pore diameter, which is really what it scales with. And mu is uh, dynamic viscosity. Of the fluid that's in there. And it's in SI units, it's Pascal seconds. Newtons per meter squared seconds, product of. And so we'll use that. Okay? So, so we've kind of, I'm just pulling it down. So we've kind of looked at a single fluid where we make the switch from thinking about behavior in terms of uh, heads and hydraulic conductivities into permeabilities and pressures. And there should be this extra term here, but let's not worry about that now. And so the next step that we have is we're interested in looking at, um, if I move it up, multiple fluids. So I suppose it would be simultaneous transport of multiple immiscible fluids. But you, get, you get the picture. And so let's switch back to um, the, the, the notes that are in here somewhere. So this is the idea. So you can imagine that within our um, medium, as we start to invade it with uh, one fluid, so green here is the, the Dean apple, the non-wetting fluid, and the, the red is the water. And so as we invade the system, um, we change the saturation. Once we get to some equilibrium saturation, so I suppose you could imagine that we're we have a capillary pressure versus saturation diagram um, that we've drawn before. This is saturation of water. This is between 0 and 1. This is a capillary pressure. This is our capillary pressure curve, at least on the... Ooh, that's a nice curve. Don't you like that? And so um, I suppose that 100% water saturated would be here, and 100% napple saturated would be here. And so I don't know what this is. This is probably 60% water saturated, maybe 70% water saturated, right? So, so maybe we are here. And so this is uh, the capillary pressure that we'd find ourselves at. The difference in the pressure between the red fluid and the green fluid is that capillary pressure. And so fluid can flow from the upstream side of this to the downstream side of this without changing the saturation. So it doesn't need to move from this particular location on the capillary, saturate, capillary pressure versus saturation curve for us to get both uh, green fluid out from one side and also red fluid out from the side at the same time if we just have a pressure gradient that we have pi across here. And so the pressure gradient would be something like this. This would be dp. This would be dx, I suppose, across the bottom. And I suppose this would be kind of um, the area, right, if we drew it in perspective as a, a little block. So this would be the the area that's coming out on the other side. So that's our little cell that we have. So what we, <clears throat> what we might do um, for a simplification is schematically to take this porous medium and imagine that we could centrifuge it to make all the green fluid at the bottom and all the red fluid at the top. Uh, but not just centrifuge the fluid, but also move the grains 
at the same time, right? So we just want to take the green, the grains that contain the green stuff and put them in the bottom, and the grains that contain the red stuff and put them in the top, and then we have a system that now has these two simultaneous uh, flows of fluid at the same time. And so we're interested in knowing what is the flux that we get out of fluid one, and what is the flux of fluid two. And so we want to be able to do that in some rational way. The other thing that we might do before we do that is that you could imagine that if you sit at different places on this curve, so for instance, if we were sitting here, then this means, so this I guess we'll call this one A, and this is A. If this is B, what does this represent? <clears throat> this means a lot of green fluid, but not very much red. So the, the saturation of water is maybe 30%. Saturation of the green fluid is 70. And so this would be our B. And so the important thing about this is that now uh, the A would be fine. You can go, the green fluid can get all the way across it, the red fluid can get the way across it. Once you change to increase the saturation of the non-wetting fluid, the green one, then all of a sudden the red one pinches off and no matter what pressure gradient that you might apply between upstream and downstream, because <clears throat> the red fluid isn't connected upstream to topologically connected between upstream and downstream, it can't get from one side to the other. So you only get Q2 coming out. Conversely, in this case, I guess this would be C. <coughs> then you have the opposite, and this is Q1 to represent these two here. Right? <coughs> yeah? Um, is this within a capillary, or is this No, like this is a porous medium. Okay. It's a block. It's a block the size of your head. So why wouldn't the red flow out the same rate as the green? Why wouldn't it? On the right-hand side? Yeah. Because it can't get from one to the other. It's held absolutely in by capillary forces attached on there firmly. And the only force that can move it is the fact that this uh, green fluid going around it can drag on it. I uh, don't do that. Can drag on it with a little bit of shear force. Right? So it would move, it could move slightly because of the green flow? It can try and move, but it'll be held. Okay. So it's, it's held in place because the force, the shear force that's applied on it is not going to be enough to overcome capillary forces. And so it's attempt to move, but it can't. Yeah. But it's a porous medium that we're using. So. so, okay. So this is kind of the geometry we'll use, but, and I guess I could do this. You have this in your notes, but I think I'm going to draw this out myself on this same thing here because it's more fun if I can find it. Was that where I was? Yeah, multiple fluids. If I can't see you over the screen, shout. Don't mean to ignore people, but I just can't, can't see. Don't use that. There you go. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Let's see. We have a small screen. All right, so what am I doing? All right, I'm going to go back to red again. So this is the idea now. So for multiple fluids, we're going to take this. It's not a capillary, so this is a core that's filled with two, with a porous medium. And we're going to centrifuge it. And so we had a... Is flu season starting? People coughing? We have these two fluids. And so the total area is A. Um, we'll just use, we won't mess around with different pressures between upstreams and downstream, but we'll use pressure change uh, with X. Um, we'll have um, a flow of fluid one and volumetric flow rate one, a flow of fluid two and volumetric flow rate two. And do we need anything else other than that? No, I don't think we do actually. So if we wanted to, uh, what we could do, we note, for instance, that uh, the area A1 is roughly equal to A times the saturation of fluid 1, right? 
So remember we said before, if we looked at these little pictures of, of ganglia, that if this is fluid one, and this is fluid two, then the rough proportions of these, of these areas, area two is proportional, I guess not, is proportional to the saturation of two, and area one would be proportional to the saturation one. I guess actually there'd be equivalencies if we just divided both of these things through by A, right? A2 divided by the total area. So if this total area of this cube is A, then the ratio of those two would be S2. The ratio of A1 over A would be equal to S1, right? By definition, roughly. And so we can write these out here, as I've done. And so what we could do is we could write Darcy's Law for each of them. And uh, so Darcy's Law says something like Q1 is going to be equal to what? It's going to be equal to the area A1 times the permeability divided by the viscosity of that fluid multiplied by the pressure drop over the length. They all have subscripts. The pressure is just between upstream and downstream, so it doesn't have a subscript. And the permeability, I didn't say it, but the permeability of a medium is independent of the fluid that's going through it. The effect of the fluid is taken care of by the viscosity of that fluid. And so we don't need to include that in here. If we make this substitution of the fact that um, A1, we can use this. Then we could write this as being total cross-sectional area times the saturation times permeability viscosity of fluid 1 dpdx. And this gives us this amount that's coming out here. So what we have here is we have something that defines um, a relative permeability. And typically this is rewritten in this very specific way that Q1 is going to be, by making a substitution, that we call this value a relative permeability. Someone's being mauled by a dog. Or someone is mauling a dog. That would be payback. relative permeability, rel perm is sometimes referred to. Uh, and so this is roughly, uh, I mean, this is a, a bit of an approximation, but you'll see where it's coming from. So total cross-sectional area, Kr of fluid 1, permeability over viscosity of fluid 1, and the pressure gradient. Likewise, for the green fluid, we can write this as Q2. And just by sub, uh, substitution, relative permeability 2, which would be the same as, it's roughly the same as the saturation of the non-wetting fluid, K over mu, dp dx, and this is fluid 2, of course. And so that allows us to describe these individual be behaviors. And so what we now are able to do, if we wanted to, is that allows us to calculate how much fluid will be flowing through in each of these previous cases that we looked at on the slide. When we have it, green fluid connecting from left to right, green fluid can flow. If the red one doesn't, then it can't flow uh, because the saturation won't be enough and the relative perm will be low. Uh, and that automatically takes care of this, this behavior. It would suggest, I suppose, if this really is the saturation, <coughs> that there would always be a finite magnitude of this relative permeability. So the other thing that we can do, and if I get myself a bit of space here, and I'll do this, is you can imagine, and I'm going to do three figures on top of each other, just to give you fair warning, if you're actually writing this stuff down, to carve yourself some space. <coughs> 
And these figures will have common lower axis, which is the saturation, but different vertical axes. Skillful, don't you think? It's amazing. Um, zero to one, so you know that this is going to be saturation of the wetting fluid. I suppose we could do it one to zero for the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. This applies to this fig, actually applies to all these figures. This is one, not a, just a vertical. This is, if you want, you can write it as 100%. But I'm going to start on the first one. So they all have a common uh, horizontal axis. So the first one uh, is uh, for saturation. Right? And so we've made the case that this saturation here we can use as a surrogate for what we're calling relative permeability. So clearly if we look at using this as saturation, and if I use my colors again, then for the non-wetting fluid when it's 100% saturated with the non-wetting fluid, we're at this point here. Where it's 0% saturated by the non-wetting fluid, it's 0 here. And in between that, it's a straight line. So all I'm doing is plotting the saturation of the non-wetting fluid as a function of the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. If I do it for the wetting fluid, then at this point here, it's... Um, 0% saturated with the non-wetting fluid. And at this point here, it's 100% saturated. No, Peter, don't want to see you. Sorry. <laughs> I did put a call into him earlier on, but I'll get him later. So this is what this curve looks like. So this is basically what this curve is like. So we've done the saturation of the, uh, the non-wetting fluid, which is green, and the saturation of the wetting fluid, which is red. I'm not going to change the colors. And that directly conforms just to this idea here. And so what we're saying is that this saturation is kind of a surrogate for what we're calling relative permeability. So this is kind of relative permeabilities. And so what we'll use instead is it will be a bit more sophisticated and uh, I'll carve out a couple of other things on here. So I'll carve out a couple of zones at the uppermost and the lowermost parts and you'll understand exactly what this is when I do that. And maybe on this one I draw something that looks like this, and something that looks a bit like this, right? So not a very good figure, I don't think, but you hopefully can decipher what this. This is capillary pressure. Capillary pressure, which is pressure in the non-wetting minus the pressure in the wetting, just by definition, and it looks like this. A relative permeability curve is going to look like this, but you can uh, you can imagine that in this case in this place here, it's going to look like the fact that we have a continuous phase of the red fluid, but the green doesn't exist from left to right, and so it can't flow, and so the capillary pressure versus saturation curves are actually going to look something like. with uh, maybe a dotted part that goes up here. And the left-hand side starts higher up. Is that not green? It's black, isn't it? I thought that's green. Uh, use it very light. Well, oh, probably not going to see that. Can you see that even? Uh, just well, it's slime green, isn't it? So this is the terrible choice of color, but you've gone with it. relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid, and the red 
is the relative permeability of the wetting fluid. So in other words, when it's 100% saturated with water, you'd expect the relative permeability to 1. It's transmissive completely to water, but absolutely not transmissive to the other fluid. And when you're at the other end of the saturation curve, the opposite is the case. So the basic idea is, is this. It allows us to be able to be able to say something about the flow rates in this system. So if we go, I'll come back to this, but let me uh, indulge me by letting me go back to uh, this earlier figure that we used here. And so what we could do is we could imagine that, um, yeah, okay. So we're interested in figuring out exactly what is able to go through here. And I won't do it as green because the oh, we got green back. I don't know how we lost green. Um, the red was our water, right? I think. And so what we might do here is we can imagine going down from this. Am I losing my mind? Is it? Didn't I just press black there? Who cares about colors? So this is the unit weight of water. This is going with the unit weight of the non wetting fluid, right? So this is the same kind of um, swimming pool analysis. You've got a complete column of, the, of water and a complete column of non wetting fluid sitting next to each other. Um, and they're happy to coexist because they're held by capillary forces. Um, if you come to any particular depth, such as this, then we know that this length here is the capri pressure. Just by definition, it's equal to the non-wetting fluid pressure minus the wetting fluid pressure. So this is the non-wetting fluid pressure. up here. Let's get myself back together again. So this is the wetting fluid pressure. So this is the wetting fluid, sorry, this is the non, this is the non-wetting fluid pressure here, which is denser than water, and this is the wetting fluid. So we can get the magnitude of this pressure differential. If we know what that pressure differential is, then do I not have a picture of that here? If we know what that pressure magnitude is here, then we can go up to this amount here. And if we go across here, uh, this is the saturation. So if we know what the cap so if you know what the capillary pressure differential is, at any particular location, we uniquely kind of define the saturation. And we can do it on this curve by getting this point here. This is the saturation of the wetting fluid and also the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. They're complementary to each other, right? This would be SW, and this would be SNW. So if we know that, then we can immediately go back to this other figure that we have and do the rest of what we need to calculate. If I can find the figure. <laughs> they all start looking the same. Is this our? Yeah, all right. So this is it here. So in other words, we know our capillary pressure as some magnitude, PC. We go across here to get the saturation. This is the saturation both of the wetting phase and of the non-wetting phase from what we just drew. They both add up to 1 together, right? SW and SNW. We know from this then 
that we can go up from here to calculate these two other portions. And the two other portions we get, that should be black, but I think it's going to be green. Oh, it is green. This is going to be the relative permeability of the wetting fluid. And this is going to be the relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid. I didn't put a number on his. This is always between 1 and 0. It's just a, a normalized scale. And so this is roughly, I don't know, 20%. And this is roughly not very much, almost 0, right, in this particular case. And so now what we can do is we should be able to calculate exactly what the flow rates would be out of that system if I zoom out by using this expression that we have here. And so if we wanted to calculate what the flow rate of water was in the system, flow rate of the wetting fluid would be equal to the cross-sectional area of the bottom of this uh, core, not the capillary, but the relative permeability of the wetting fluid the permeability of that porous medium, viscosity of the wetting fluid, and the pressure from upstream to downstream, or the pressure gradient. And likewise, I don't know if it's green or whether I switched my colors. I think actually it should be green. I thought that was green, no? non-wetting is just by switching the again this is the total cross-sectional area it's not the the fractional cross-sectional area relative permeability of the non-wetting permeability viscosity of the non-wetting fluid and the pressure gradient that's driving it and for each of these this term here was a hundredth roughly or less <coughs> and this is 0 0.2 that's it so so that's kind of the whole cycle, from figuring out exactly what Darcy's law is to being able to split it for two different fluids that are flowing, that are kind of intermingled. Uh, we kind of deconvolve them from each other, unwind them so that they're in separate <coughs> pods, and then look at them flowing separately. And so that's really all there is to multiphase flow. So I think that's uh, hopefully that's the, the best way to be able to demonstrate it. If we go back to the, the previous material and just, well, we, didn't, we went through this, we went, yeah, we've covered this, then this really says it all. This is basically that uh, behavior that we've now rationalized uh, that we perhaps will talk a little bit, well, we don't need to, we can talk about it here. And you see exactly that behavior. So we said before that roughly we could imagine that the relative permeability curves might look like this, but they don't. Sometimes we think of the relative permeability curves would look like this as an idealization uh, on both sides. Uh, because obviously in these zones here, this is the zone in which none of the, the, the nap None of the water can flow because it's disconnected. And in this zone here, um, none of the napple can flow because it's disconnected. And so that's the rationale for having these different zones on either side. And if we look at what the real curves look like, they are just as we drew them. So this one kind of starts a bit higher because the water preferentially fills the big pores first. And it comes down here and has to get to being zero at the irreducible saturation. The red one does the opposite. It starts lower, and it goes down here, along here, and again is uh, irreducible. And I guess the only interesting thing about this is that you add together the relative permeabilities of the wetting fluid, which is this one, and the relative permeabilities of the non-wetting fluid. Unlike saturations, 
they're not equal to 1. So the, if you add these two curves together, you get this curve here, this dashed curve here, and it clearly is not equal to 1. And of course, um, that's a bit different from our initial simplification. Our simplification was that if you take the relative permeability curves and just draw them as equal to the saturation, clearly if you add these two curves I just drew as an x together, they do give you 1 all the way across the domain. And so this is just the real behavior. And the utility of this is to be able to, for instance, to calculate how much, um, in this particular case, this is often the situation that we'll be in. We'll have a lot of water in the system and not very much non-wetting fluid. And it probably kind of relates to this behavior here. right? A lot of water, which is the light brown colored material. And the Dean apple is the red, which clearly doesn't completely fill the pore space. And so we'd be interested how quickly water flows across this from one side to the other. Because in doing that, it can dissolve the Dean apple, and it can take it from being pristine, potable water to stuff you really don't want to drink that's down gradient. And now we know exactly how to do that, because we can get the relative permeabilities of this. So if we know exactly what saturation we sit at, then this would be our relative permeability of water. And just by using Darcy's law, we can calculate exactly what the volumetric flow rates would be. And if we know what the volumetric flow rates would be, and we know how much is dissolved in it per unit volume, then you can calculate the contaminant flux as well, just as you did for Yucca Mountain kind of in a more complicated system. Time's up? Probably? Almost? Questions? I never stop to ask for questions. But we did get one question. Thank you for clarification. <laughs> 